new place that people will go to get this package from her. So next, she. How does it know they both refer to the same thing? It knows that they both refer to the same thing because there's an inference algorithm that's well documented, and you can say, what would this thing be inferred as? And essentially, what's going on here is that because it's a file, it's a URL that refers to a file. That file is an archive, and so we truncate off the name of the archive, uh, and then it's now Narsh, which is the same name as the directory was. So it comes from the URL rather than something that's inside. It comes from the, the source. We call this thing, this uh, URL, the package source. There are many different kinds of package sources, and every source has a designated way to go from source to name. But we'll get to whether it can be specified some other way very shortly. Okay, so she goes on. She said, I found a way to improve something. So she edits her file, her program again. Now she re-zips everything, recopies it to the server, and then emails it out again. So it says, hey guys, you might want to update this. So now someone says, it's really annoying to check for updates constantly. And the worst thing is, I try to check for an update, and it just downloads your whole zip file, and it's really big, even when it's never different. Every time I run Reiko package update, it downloads the whole zip file. What's going on? So now a cranky racket developer who looks like a little troll, no one that you know, <laughs> said, you should be using a checksum file for this. Didn't you read the documentation? Now what she should have done, or what she can do, is she can produce a file that ends in checksum that has this, that's the name of her package plus checksum. And it can be any information whatsoever. It's really convenient to use something like an MD5 sum. Now whenever she changes her package, she can create this checksum and also send that to the server. Now the package system will be more efficient because it will say, what is the checksum for this zip file? Uh, and now I don't need to download the zip file, I can just download the checksum. And the checksum, I use the word checksum, but it really is any data whatsoever. You could write in your name, and then next time, write your mother's maiden name, and then the time after that, write your social security number, whatever you feel like. Okay. <clears throat> so now, whenever she modifies her program, she goes through a big process. She says, I changed my program. I re-zip it. I recreate the checksum. Now I send them both to the server. And then I go email everybody and say, you should run Reiko package update to try to get the new version. So she then says, why is it so inconvenient to update my package? I have four steps. Um, four, yeah, it's four, because there's create the zip, create the checksum, copy them, and email everybody. Uh, and four, that's way too many steps, right? There's no package system that requires more than four steps. Okay. And now the cranky racket developer says, you know, it's because you're not using GitHub. You should really be using something else. So she, what she can do is she can go through this process of going into her directory, initializing Git, adding some stuff, and then pushing it onto the Git server. Now when she does that, she can say, just run a package update and say the new package now comes from this GitHub repository. My name is Terra, and the packages in the repository is called Narsh. Everybody who has it installed, no matter how they installed it, whether they installed it with the zip or whether they installed it with the directory, running this, they'll now be attached to GitHub now. So now it's really convenient for her, because she, she wonders, is it easier to update now, really? Did I believe this? So now when she edits her file, she does one thing. She types git push, and now that's propagated out to everybody. It automatically creates the zip file. It automatically creates the checksum. And yes, but she still might want to, she says, oh, this is awesome. So she still is writing to everybody saying that, you know, I updated it. You might want to check it out. So again, we have the cranky racket developer. Why are you spamming the mailing list every time you create a new package update? Why don't you just list it on the catalog server, and then people can read the RSS feed? Because the catalog server produces an RSS feed of every time any package changes. So she says, this is great. So what she does is she runs a command, catalog upload, that looks at her catalog credentials, it lists the name of the package, and then the source for it. Now, Narsh is a package that the package catalog knows about, knows it's for this source. And now people, instead, they can write Reiko package update Narsh. And what this does is now it changes how they installed the Narsh package from the zip or the directory or the GitHub, and now uses the catalog server. So now she has this, the catalog server as a way to direct people towards her package. 
And the best part is that when she makes a change, she just pushes, and she doesn't need to tell anybody about it. They can just look at the RSS feed. So she decides to make her program more interesting. She creates a new directory called returners, because you know, she's done simulating NAR. She's wanted to go into the next stage of the simulation, where she's going to talk about the returners. And so she creates this new file, and inside of it, she wants to refer back to, her other, to the rest of her program, the Narsh Magitech piece. So now when she runs her program, though, there's an error. The error says, I don't know what the heck Narsh Magitech is. And the reason, they don't, that, the reason that she doesn't know, or rather that, that, the, that returners errors, is because she, this entire time, has never had to install the package on her own machine. She's been developing it totally disconnected from the package system. But it's important for her that she needs to install it. But because she's the developer, she doesn't want to download it from GitHub because she's going to be editing it locally. And so there's a special kind of package that you can install called a package link that connects your directory directly into Racket so that all the changes that you make are immediately reflected. And so it's as if it's installed, so all the same rules for determining what modules are around are enforced, but um, it's uh, locally modifiable by you. So now when she does this, she can run the returners program. So now she says, well, I'd really like to distribute this program too. But now she's a wise, seasoned Racket developer. And she knows the way that she's going to do this. She's going to initialize it to Git, push everything, and use catalog update. So right away, she's going to start using GitHub because she had such a good experience with it before. Now someone says, I tried to install returners, and it died because Narsh Magitech wasn't found. Because this person looked on the site and said, oh, this returners package looks so cool. I want to try this out. Downloaded it, and it's broken. You can't use it. And the reason it's broken is because inside of returners, she didn't write down that she depends on Narsh. So packages have a metadata file called info where they can list what their dependencies are. And they can depend on other packages. And she depends, returners depends on Narsh. So now when she uploads this, now it will work for users. So now she says, I really want to use this cool new feature of the next version of Racket. So there's a new version of Racket that came out. And she'd really like to incorporate one of its features into her program. So she edits her program, and she includes a reference to this new feature. And she uploads it. And now someone says, um, I can't use your program in uh, Racket version 5.9. What's going on? And what happened is uh, Edgar updated his, sorry, Edgar had it installed and updated Narsh, but did not update his installation of Racket, which of course he would have no way to know that he should have. So Terra can solve this problem by tagging a particular release of her, of her Git repository. And so what this cute syntax does is it checks out the last commit, branches it, and names it Narsh for 5.9, and then pushes that reference back to the server. Now what she can do is she can go and run the catalog version command and say Narsh for version 5.9 should really be using this other source. So a package on the catalog server is really an abstraction of many different packages for different Racket versions. So you can say, when a Racket 5.9 client asks for the Narsh source, give it this one instead. So that now that version 5.9 will continue to work all those users out there who are still using 5.9. When they try to install Narsh, they'll get the one that does not use the nifty new feature. Did I see a question? Yes, uh, I don't like Norse. Can I uh, register this uh, Norse to use the MySlime server instead? <laughs> Say that again. I don't like Norse. I want users of Norse to use my tiny version of Norse or my, version, my NSA uh, Troy and uh, version of Norse. <laughs> yes, uh, we'll talk about that in a moment, actually. Okay. Yep. Uh, the short answer is that the catalog server uh, is a open source software that's really easy to run. And B uses a RESTful protocol that can be backed by just a file system set up the right way. So you do not need to run any software whatsoever. Uh, it's really easy to make a catalog. And so there's nothing special about our catalog. One of the things that Matthew, of course, mentioned is that a guiding principle of Racket is that the core, we don't follow rules that we don't expect you to follow. 
Okay. So, uh, <laughs> sorry. Try this positively. I was confused by two negatives. Okay. Everything that you can do, we can do. Everything that we can do, you can do. For some value of everything. Yeah, for some value of everything. Unless it's <laughs> unless we're talking about typed racket and writing type rules. I'm not sure that's <laughs> 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 Okay. So, <laughs> so now another user comes and he says, I tried to install, I checked out Narsh version 5.9, and I put it in this directory, Narsh version 5.9, because I wanted to see what was there. But when I installed it, it's messed up because I can't require Narsh mag slash Magitech. And the reason is that Terra, she was relying on the inference algorithm. And the inference algorithm for directories looks at the name of the directory. What she can do is she can create a metadata file for Narsh that says, I'm a collection that's named this, and override whatever the inference algorithm would have chosen. This makes it a more robust package about being, that is allowed to be distributed in different ways. Okay. Uh, now, the angry racket developer says, internal linking is bad. And what this means is that if you use the inference algorithm, your programs that require the module will we'll have references to the name of the package. If you use a collection like this, the collection can be arbitrarily different than the name of the package, which means that the code is more free to be, dis to be provided by different packages. So one of the guiding principles of the package system is that packages are outside of the program. And because they're outside of the program, you can, you can more easily change which modules a program is talking about, which is important for backwards compatibility and important for having other people maintain software. We'll talk more about this later. But it shows up for the first time here. So uh, now Tara says, I've got this new feature that I want to implement. So she edits the Narsh simulation, creates this new file called Lark, Lock. Right now she's got Magitech, Lone Wolf, and Lock now. So then she starts adding. She did, yeah, she ignored the troll. Okay. Well, actually, the troll is really commenting on the fact that what she just did was a good thing. It was good to have written that collection name there at all. Yeah. So she then edits her returners package and now starts referring to Narshlock. So what she's done is that returners, the second package, is now depending on this new feature that she's added to Narsh. So Locke himself says, I just installed returners on my machine that already has Narsh, and it was broken because Narsh slash Locke isn't there. He can't even spell his own name right. Unbelievable. Now the problem is, is that if you already have a package installed, then when you install a new one, it doesn't force you to upgrade everything that you have installed. So if you already have package A, and A adds a feature, and then you install B that depends on A, it will just install it, which means that this is a bad package because it has depended on a new feature of another package without specifying which one it needs. So how she can fix this is that the Racket developer says, you should use version 1.0 if you've now finished writing the package. So packages can say, I am a particular version. And what we do in the package system and as the Racket community is 1.0 means I am committing to you that this interface is stable. I'm not going to add or remove things. But whenever you add a new feature, you upgrade, you update that package number towards positive infinity. Okay, so she can edit her metadata for Narsh and say this is version 2.0, which is telling her, telling her users that this is a commitment to this version. So now she can edit the metadata for Narsh and say I don't just require the Narsh package, but I require it at version 2.0. Now, arguably, uh, what she has done is she's made a backwards incompatible change. The reason it's backwards incompatible in a certain technical sense is that whenever you add a feature, you potentially collide with other things on your user system that you didn't know about. So a good example of this is that if we add the feature um, you know, flatten to imagine flatten wasn't in racket list and we added it. And you required, you know, you had Sam's amazing list library. 
and it required flatten. Now your program would be broken because those two names would conflict. Historically, in Racket, we have not considered adding new features as being backwards incompatible changes. There is a technical reason to say that they are, but our culture has said that it is not backwards incompatible to add stuff. It's only backwards incompatible to remove things or violate the previous documentation. So anyway, so we incorporate that culture into the package system in the semantics that we give to versions. Can I retroactively add an incompatible feature to the old version? Now that it's not compatible with the new one? Every package has a version number, yes. um, whether or not they wrote it down or not. So by default, it is assumed that the version is 0.0, .0 if it's not mentioned in the metadata. Can I add to the catalog something saying this old version actually has a feature? Uh, OK, so the question is, can you change the catalog server to talk about previous versions? Yes. Uh, the catalog server says that a package crossed with a racket version equals a source. And there cannot be multiple sources for the same racket version, but those sources may be arbitrarily different from one another. So you could change the GitHub repository and make a, make a new check, make a new branch that corresponds to this old version. So I think, that, I think the answer to your question is yes. So next, this is kind of related. Someone says, how do I get version 0.0, .0 of Narsh after it's gone? I love that version, even though it didn't last very long. This is a very, uh, this is a very, uh, sorry? Dinosaur. Yeah, this is a dinosaur thought. <laughs> so he says, this question does not make sense. <laughs> and the reason it doesn't make sense has to do with our semantics that we give to compatibility. Uh, there's no reason to want version 0 because version 1 has everything that version 0 did. If it had something different, then you should have not have called version 1 version 1. It would just be a totally different package. So if the interface changes in a way where anybody would want the old version, then that means you've created a new package. And if it hasn't, then this question does not make sense. You should not want this. And given that the package system does not let you want this, that means that you as a developer have to follow this rule that we've been following in Racket for a long time, which is that we care about our users and allowing them to have compatibility long into the future. And that is a, that is a good thing, because it makes it so that we provide more service for our clients. Yes, Doug. That, that to me doesn't make sense because version one could have been 10,000 times slower than version zero. That means that the interface has changed. So this is this would be an ins so if the performance of your program is an important characteristic of it, then that would be included in your documentation. We would say I make these various guarantees. And if you change the program in such a way that those guarantees are now violated, you now have produced a new package. Now, the question is whether you, in fact. Ah, yes, so we'll get there. Yes, so we'll get there. There's something very. The, there's the, the situation is coming up, but essentially what it is is that we're in Racket, we have not, we have not pursued making technical rules to prevent bad behavior. Instead, what we have done is we have used persuasion, long-suffering, and love unfeigned. <laughs> and so the proper thing to do in that situation is to have a conversation with the other developer and say, I really think that you've made a bad decision on this package. Could you revert your change? Can you make your new version called something different because it's really not providing the same interface that I thought it should? So that kind of conversation is what we do in the racket world, not saying, you have violated rule X, prepare to die. All right? Sorry, I missed something. Is, so version 0. Point, I mean, so, so 1.0 could have everything that 0, 0. 0.0 has. Yes. But it, can, so it, it cannot even have more identifiers? Is that what I missed? When the version number goes up, you can add stuff. So maybe what, what ever what was loved about version 0, 0.0 was that it did not have those identifiers that version 1.0 had? Perhaps. Yep. And that would mean that for this user scenario, 
the semantics of adding is OK, adding is not incompatible, would be wrong. And as I mentioned before, in the racket world, we have always said that adding is not bad. And there is a technical reason why adding would be bad, and that is a conversation that we need to have about a particular package. There's no need to create a rule that everybody has to follow or not, which is what we've done in Racket. So one way to understand the package system is that we are exposing what the core does to everybody. The core is not special. We follow the same rules that you do, and you follow the same rules that we do, as opposed to saying that there are things that we can do that you can't, and things that you can do that we can't. The Racket developer is right that this question that you want version 0 does not necessarily make sense. Ah, uh, it does not. OK, the necessarily is kind of missing there. <laughs> sure. Uh, the Racket developer is kind of grumpy. Yeah, this the Racket developer is grumpy. I'm not asking if he's grumpy or not. I'm asking if he's right. <laughs> it, it, he's, the Racket developer is normally right in this situation that what it means in Racket for the version to be incompatible is you can add things. Uh, Adding is compatible. Matthias has a comment. I'd like to say something. Yeah, I think one way to put it is we are trying to expose, we, we like to develop, we're trying to expose ourselves to the exact same circumstances that you live under as a non developer so that we suffer from the same pains that you experience in the real world. By doing so, we, we develop protocols on how to negotiate these package updates. And we would like to share those protocols with you so that you can avoid those pains that you may have gone through too. Exactly. And one of the things that we've learned over time is that saying what it means, it's, it's too, we, when we chain ourselves to the, to the interface exactly, it's too much. And so we say that removing and changing documented behavior, that's incompatible, but adding is not. And this is not universally true. And when it isn't universally true, we need to have a conversation about it. Yes. So there's more to say about the package system. And naturally, we can debate many, many things. Uh, so there will be ample time for more questions. Let's talk about more features that it has. So Tara decides that she needs to do something more. Uh, she wants to actually play the music. But playing the music is different on every system. And so she has to write something that says, I'm going to look at what the system I'm on and then dynamically require a different module depending on the system. Now what that means is that she needs to update her dependencies to say, when I'm on Mac OS X, I need to use OpenAL. And when I'm on Windows, I need to use Direct Audio. So in the same way that dependencies can specify versions of, of the other package, uh, dependencies can specify, when I'm on this platform, I require this particular package. This is one of the other ways you can specify your dependencies. Okay, So now she says, I think that maybe it's time to write documentation for this module. So what she does is she opens up a scribble file. And she adds some scribbling information to her NARSH info. Now the thing that's interesting here is that scribblings is not metadata for a package. It is metadata for a collection. When a package only has one collection in it, like her NARSH package, the metadata is shared between them. So everything that's allowed in a collection metadata file is allowed in a package one for single collection packages. So now the ghost says, um, Reiko set up dies when I try to install your package on my uh, EC2 instance because Scribble isn't there. So she's now created a new dependency on another piece of the Racket core. Every package implicitly depends on base, but it does not implicitly depend on other features of Racket, such as Scribble, or Slideshow, or the GUI library. And Scribble is one of those things that she must specify. So she adds that she wants to depend on Scribble lib. Now, unfortunately, the ghost says, uh, you didn't actually fix my problem because I don't want to install Scribble. You just made it so that now I know that I, now that I can't even sell your package at all. So the true thing that she should have done is she should have changed her build dependencies. So Racket has a concept of phases. You may have heard of them. That when your program runs and when it compiles are different times. And so this idea is reflected in the package system. That you can have dependencies for when you build and dependencies for when you run. So she can specify more precisely that she only needs Scribble when she's compiling her program. 
Now she has a question. Uh, how did you install it at all uh, without building it? And the reason is that there's this command called export package, where you can say, I want to take this package that I have installed, Narsh, and export it to a binary. And it will give a version of the package, a custom uh, zip file, essentially, that can be installed on another machine that is already built. And then the user can then send that to their EC2 instance and install it there without building it. And now somebody else says, they do, I do the same thing, but I want to give the students the code for your package, but also have it built so it installs really fast. And there's another version uh, called a built package. Uh, and in the future, you'll be able to go to a secret URL and download the, the binary and built versions of every package that's been blessed in a certain way uh, so that no, nobody will have to wait for Rayco setup to finish if they don't want to. They could install the binary or built version. OK, so now. Tara wants to add a new feature. She wants to a add a Rayco command to her package so that she can write Rayco play, and then it will actually play a file. So she's adding essentially an executable. So she edits it. She edits the. Uh, she implements it. She adds it to the Rayco commands. Now, unfortunately, it won't work unless she also says that whenever you install my package, you can't just set up Narsh. You have to set up Rayco as well to know about this. So the package system, again, allows you to, has many things that are inferred and allows you to be more specific when it's important for your problem. In Mog, of course, he doesn't want all this weird NARSH simulation. He wants to just play the music. And so what she does is she creates another package called the music player. She moves things around, and then she edits her new implementation. And she creates a new packet, a, a new info file for this new package that installs multiple collections. It installs Narsh and it installs this new music package. So it's got two things in it. So two collections means that it's, you use the special collection tick multi. So this is again the idea that there are features that the package system uh, provides to everybody that were previously reserved for the core namely having packages that include many modules. Uh, I'm going to skip this one because we're running a little, little on time. Um, when you do this, if a program, so if one, pa so what she does is she says that Narsh depends on her, her new package, Music Player. That's the first, the top line up there. But if she does that, then old programs that use Narsh will now stop working because the package is provided by a dependent, or the module is provided by a dependency of Narsh. So there's this thing called implies, where you can say, whenever you install my package, it's as if you installed these various dependencies of mine. So that you sort of see through the package. This is a way to increase compatibility, or rather maintain compatibility, while breaking up the package into pieces. Uh, when you add features from other people, like through Git, you might introduce uh, new modules like a data slash GPU vector module. And if that happens to conflict with some other package, like the general GPU package, then what we do at that point is this is where we have that persuasion and long suffering that I talked about, where there's two packages out there that are both really valuable. And we need to have a conversation about how we're going to resolve this conflict. Because we want Racket users to be in able to install all packages simultaneously. This is a desire that we have. And so we try to solve this not by making it so that it's always possible through the technical makeup of the system, but because we can talk to one another because we're all humans. So in this situation, maybe we decide that the general, data, the general GPU library is really the better one, and she should remove her implementation. You have a comment, Eric? Uh, well, question. What specifically, what conflict are you referring to? Is the name of the package? Yes, the name, of the, the name of the module. So this package music player, it provides the module data GPU vector, which is presumably also provided by general GPU library. So now there's these two packages that both have the same module, so you can't install them at the same time. And if I were to say require a GPU vector? It doesn't know which one it is. In fact, in the package system, will prevent you from installing it. Yes. 
And so the way that we resolve that is by a conversation. Now, one thing is that technically what has just happened is there is an incompatibility between the version with data GPU vector and the one without it. Because we, we added a feature and then we took it away. So that, fall, that falls under the, oh, we've now introduced an incompatibility, right? But such small gaps of incompatibility are not important because we are not following some rule just mechanically. We're talking with one another and we say, it was a mistake to have made this change. Let's revert it. And that's allowed because we do that in Racket and we should allow package developers to do the same thing. Undo maybe mistakes that they've done. So she asked this question. Okay. So if she goes and changes everything, at that point, if everything will break for other people, and she should really name her package something different. We talked a lot about this earlier, so I'll skim over this. But the only, the only difference is that she can maintain the other one existing in perpetuity. And we can ask the question whether it makes sense to run multiple versions of the package at the same time. If so, they should really have different modules provided as well. So the very last thing that I want to talk about uh, is the idea that Suppose that you have a collection of packages. You'd like to be able to move all your packages over to another system. And there's two ways to do that. One way is to output the list of packages with every checksum that is installed. You store that in a file. You can move it over to some server and then import them back in. Now, one problem with that is that maybe you installed a package that doesn't offer old checksums, like it's a zip file or something. If you do that, then that just means you're using a bad package. So don't use zip file packages if you want to be able to do this. Or there's a more advanced command where it doesn't export the list of packages. It actually exports a big binary blob that has all the data inside of them. This is essentially sort of like looping that earlier command that produces the binary. So you can say snapshot my machine exactly these packages. So I'll move them all over so you can install them. So this is a really good thing to do when like setting up like a cloud instance or a VM or something like that. So that's the end of the story. And just in summary, the core is the same as the leaves. Social processes are valuable. Compatibility is really valuable. And in Racket, we have rarely broken compatibility. The few times that we have is when we have stuff like two HTTP image versus HTTP image, Ms. Scheme versus Scheme versus Racket. And incompatibility is removing features and disobeying your documentation. A package is a set of modules, and numbers go up for features. And dependencies can be vanilla, versioned, or platformed. And dependency violations are just warnings. Your program won't break. A good package has a neutral name, is on GitHub, is, has an explicit name, or is multi, is listed officially and doesn't conflict with anything. A better one follows the version rules, which we've talked about, uh, and also updates the catalog when you depend on new Racket features. Uh, and the best ones have documentation and tests and are responsive, have responsive authors who participate in our community. Other ones that aren't not so good uh, are not really for public consumption. But if you want to communicate with other people, uh, not through the catalog server and not through these channels, you can distribute sources or make your own catalog server. The system has features to install many different kinds of collections of packages, which is complicated and a little bit beyond uh, what's worth talking about in this setting. But there's interesting documentation about how this works. Some, there are some open problems. There's just work that we need to do. But there, the more important open problems are how we deal with modular documentation. Stuff like, how do you look at the documentation and say, what are things that are structure properties? What are functions that work on lists? How can a package extend the tutorial or the guide or the reference or add a new piece to the data manual, these sorts of things? We don't have a solution for this. And this is one of the things that we need to discover as a community how to do. And finally, there is definitely a desire for multiple simultaneous versions for all aspects of the system, not just user packages, so the core as well. So that's an open problem. And I don't think anybody knows a solution to that. And until we have something that we can all work with, we don't want to do a half-baked solution. So that's all. Please, questions? So we're, we're running a little short on time, so let's just take one question while Greg's setting up. I, I, want, I want to go back to what Matthias said. 
Yeah, and just go download them again. So remember, you can export. So the question is, is it possible to go back with Racket? Yes, because you can go re-download it. Is it possible to go back with packages? Yes, because good packages are in GitHub. So you just go install the source directly by looking up what the checksum used to be. You can install any version that has ever existed in humanity. Okay. Because you can look at what the checksum is and install exactly that version. Okay. And if you are really concerned about these things, then what you should do is on your test machine, you update, you see if your system works, and otherwise you roll back. Well, but you know, for example, 545, I couldn't use it because it had a bug that didn't affect you guys, but it didn't affect me. My code wouldn't run. Exactly, and that's the, that's the sort of thing that having a responsive author that communicates with the community is really valuable for. Because when we screw up, then responsive authors will help us improve the system. And it's that kind of communication that has been valuable for the racket journey that we've all been on. Yes. So uh, please uh, send more complaints to me uh, during the intermediate time. Uh, and naturally, I love you all. <laughs>